When you're heading offshore on a passage, you have to figure out what your watch schedule is going to be. So what are some things you might want to take into consideration? Hi, I'm Nika Waters, and welcome to the Boat Galley Podcast. Today I'm talking about watch schedules, and the fact that there's actually no one-size-fits-all for everyone. Today's episode of the Boat Galley Podcast is brought to you by R&W Rope Rigging Solutions. R&W's experienced rigging team can handle any size project, from running and standing rigging to furlers, winches, inspections, and more. They carry all major brands and customize to your requirements. Use coupon code PODCAST10 for 10% off all rope and hardware, including architectural and decorative projects. Visit rwrope.com or call for your free consultation. When you're sailing from place to place, someone's on watch all the time. That means that they're in charge and pretty much responsible for making sure the boat's doing what it's supposed to be doing. This is true whether it's a couple hour day sail or a multi-day passage. And yeah, actually when you're mid-ocean, you don't stop for the night. You just keep sailing. So even in the middle of the night, someone's awake and in charge. But how do you figure out who's on when? When you're running these different people in charge of things on the boat thing. It's called watches. And so when people talk about a watch schedule, it's all about who is keeping watch, who's in charge of the boat during that period of time. And what kind of a watch schedule to keep on your boat is another one of those very much it depends cruising decisions. Watches of shorter duration means that you don't have to stay up for as long a time, but it also means that you don't get a lot of straight stretches of sleep. Watches of shorter duration mean that you're not in charge for as long a chunk of time. Deciding on the balance can be tricky and can take some tweaking. Generally, when we're on short sales, and I think this is true for most of the people that I talk to, our watch keeping is a whole lot less official. We're generally both in the cockpit, we're hanging out, enjoying the sail, there might be a project happening, the other person knows that they're sort of in charge of the boat, but it's really pretty loose. There's no need for anything official when we'll be at anchor that night. For longer voyages, though, an official rotation of some sort helps keep the peace. It's not, you don't tend to feel like you're spending more time awake and in charge and the other person is getting to enjoy more rest. Plus, actually, it's an important safety consideration because sleep deprivation, it's a real thing. Sleep deprivation has been shown to be more detrimental to focus and reaction time even more detrimental than over-imbibing alcohol, believe it or not. Compound sleep deprivation over lots and lots of days. And if you're running sleep deprivation on passage, when you're getting into port, when it's most important to be alert and focused and aware, that might be when your reaction time is less keen. Getting enough sleep is absolutely critical on passage. Offshore on Calypso, we've always done three-hour watches during the night. Now, up until this last passage, the longest that we'd ever done, just the two of us, was four days crossing the Caribbean. And so that three hour was, yeah, that's what we started with. Definitely we do more flexible timing during daylight hours, and that was true even on this most recent passage. We always used to start the rotation at about 10 o'clock. During summer 2021, we experimented with starting watches more like 8 o'clock at night which worked really well because I could get in a solid nap. Jeremy took the first watch, then I had 11 to two, and then again a five to eight. It tended to fit with our natural tendencies of sleep-wake patterns, and it didn't really feel like as much of a slog. What we wound up doing this passage, after actually writing this blog post and talking to a lot of people about their watch schedules, we did far looser, again, the same sort of thing. Sunset would happen, we'd eat dinner, and then start watches probably around 7 or 7.30, but we were doing four-hour watches ostensibly. Jeremy would take the first watch, I'd crash, I'd get up at 11 or 12, depending on what time it all sort of started up and went, and I actually wound up staying up until the sun came up around 5 in the morning. Jeremy would wake up with sunlight I felt like I had a good time to get sort of my my rhythm going when I was on watch. He got in a really solid chunk of sleep. And then 
pretty much after he got up, I went down and crashed again for three hours. We do tend to keep the same watch schedule, meaning that he's usually the one to start watches, and then I take over after he's had four or five hours on. Sleep research has shown that it's actually easier to be on a disrupted schedule. That is what happens when you're on passage and you're not able to just get your solid seven or eight hours straight at night. If the disruption is consistent, it's a little bit easier to be on a disrupted schedule because your body just gets used to, okay, it's now it's time to get up. It's midnight and I'm going to get up and be awake till four. How did we initially decide on three hour watches that we used to do? Well, we read about it in a book somewhere. I think it was a Lynn and Larry party book. They always had done three hour watches and three hours actually felt pretty reasonable. Felt like enough time to settle into a routine in the cockpit, short enough time that we didn't lose focus. The sleep felt reasonable enough, especially with a nap somewhere during the day. And of course, doing this most recent passage and shifting it to more like four or even longer meant that the person off watch got in a really good solid amount of sleep. That said, on this last passage, the very last night we were out, we actually needed to be tacking, short tacking up Sir Francis Drake Channel because we couldn't, we didn't have fuel and we couldn't get into Soper's Hole. And that was a little more demanding. And so we did shorter time periods of being on watch because two hours on and two hours off was, that was about what you could handle because you needed to be really, really super focused and alert. When we crossed the Atlantic on Pelican Express with our friends, there were four of us to share the duties. And what we did for that was we did a modified four hour schedule. One person was on, on for two hours. The other person was on, another person was on standby for two hours. And then when you were off, you were off for four hours solid. And you weren't the first person who was called. If there was a problem, that was the standby person. And we rotated. Everyone had the chance to be with everybody else. Everybody rotated through the middle of the night watches. I don't remember this being a really hard schedule, but it was decades ago. And I may well have forgotten. My friend Kristen on Sailing Positive Waves and her husband Hans, they do six-hour watches. And if I recall correctly, they do this 24 hours a day. This is a schedule that has morphed as their cruising experience has gotten greater. They used to do two on, two off that they started with, and now they have very happily gone to six-hour watches. That means that everybody gets to get into the groove of being on watch and then enjoy a really solid six-hour sleep session. Christian says this is a fantastic schedule, and I know it's one of the reasons we talked about this, and it's one of the reasons we decided to try going with a slightly longer watch schedule on our most recent passage. BN on Sailing Totem has noted that actually a shift to longer watches is one that tends to happen on many cruising boats. You start with shorter sessions of being in charge, especially at night, and you gradually settle into longer periods that enable longer sleep. One of the things that I will say, and this would shift if we did not have an autopilot, it would be very difficult to go to super long watch schedule because of the draining nature of hand steering. And it is my strong opinion that the most valuable piece of gear that any shorthanded crew planning on long passages can have is a robust autopilot with a backup. Steering the boat by hand all the time is exhausting and would make figuring out the watch schedule balance between sleep needs and time in charge a little bit more tricky. On Calypso, we have both an electric autopilot, actually we have two of them, as well as the mechanical self-steering vane that Jeremy built. About the only absolute for a watch schedule aboard is that you actually do need to have one if you're doing overnight passages. Whether it's two, three, four, some hybrid, some mix, somebody's happier being on longer, whatever, but knowing who's in charge and whose turn it is to sleep is critical. And don't be afraid to experiment to see what works for you. I can't wait to share an anchorage with you somewhere. Now that we're in the Caribbean, if you're down here, just come say hello. Where we're not gonna be running watches and we don't have to worry about our current watch schedule. Thank you so much for listening to the Boat Galley podcast. We love hearing from our listeners. We love it when you don't forget to leave a review so other people can find us more easily. 
We love it when you share us with your friends. And we love it, of course, when you don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app. Have the most spectacular week.